Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this uh, morning's keynote uh, speaker uh, likely needs no introduction to an audience like this that has uh, had uh, long, rich experience uh, with uh, Middle East uh, politics. Uh, but uh, Tariq Mitri is the director of the Assam Faris Institute for Public Policy and International Affairs at the American University uh, in Beirut, AUB of Beirut, AUB. And from 2005 to 2011, he served uh, successive Lebanese governments as, uh, in, in different capacities as minister, a member of the cabinet, including minister of environment, minister of administrative reform, uh, minister of culture, minister of information, and, and acting minister of foreign affairs. He also was special representative of the United Nations Secretary General and head of the UN support uh, mission in, in, in Libya. He has taught at half dozen universities across the world and has authored several books and articles on contemporary Arab issues, uh, particularly uh, issues pertaining to religion and politics, interreligious and intercultural dialogue uh, in Arabic, in English, and uh, in, in French. At a more detailed bio uh, is available in your uh, program uh, book. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, please uh, join me uh, in welcoming uh, Tariq Mitri at this time. Thank you. Thank you, Khalil. I'm very pleased to be here this morning. Well, when I was in Tripoli, Libya, trying to help steer the so-called transition to democracy, I was always confronted with the perplexity of Libyan political leaders vis-a-vis -vis US policy. More often than not, I was asked about the meaning of America's leading from behind. Uh, the expression you're familiar with, used by an unnamed aide who thought to celebrate President Obama's subtlety in supporting the NATO intervention in Libya. Following the military withdrawal and the, inter and the limited interest in stabilizing their country, my visitors repeatedly wondered if the US meant doing less and engaging less when they used the metaphor of a light footprint. Those who attributed to the US an unavowed interventionist policy and their opponents, those who were worried about America's withdrawal, both had equal, though differently motivated doubts about the reversal of the imperial overreach abroad. They did not believe that the US had put into question its unrivaled leadership in the world. It took some time before they learned that the American president had initially and strongly opposed intervention in their country and ended up acting against his own instincts, endorsing a no-fly zone, because he thought that the operation would be relatively easy and limited. Libyans and many other Arabs had difficulties realizing that Obama's approach to the Middle East was distant from the outset. The interest in pursuing an agreement with Iran notwithstanding. At the same time, this was a president who thought to improve the US image in the Muslim world. Not only in ending unpopular wars, but in avoiding new entanglements. But the US, after having broken Iraq,
opted under Obama in the year 2011 for leaving without having sufficiently helped repair the damage it has done. While trying to avoid interventionist policies that lead to disasters, President Obama was tempted to see the, reg the region from the narrow lens of counterterrorism. He expanded the use of special operation forces, drone strikes, and cyber warfare to limit what he saw as terrorist threats to the USA. Today, the preeminence of war against terrorism, ISIS in particular, above or at the expense of other considerations, continue to determine the course of a minimal US involvement in the region. Some political leaders in the Arab world seem to raise mutatis mutandis, the very questions raised by my Libyan interlocutors. Even if their perception of American policy is today significantly blurred by both the unreadability and the unpredictability of the current president's positions. Moreover, it has not been easy to draw the right distinction between withdrawing from the global scene and acting unilaterally. In addition, American foreign policy is seen more than in previous years as subservient to domestically motivated and tactical political considerations. Among those who failed to recognize that the Middle East lost much of its importance in American eyes, it is believed that the stakes of the US outweighed the real influence exercised by its leaders. Unsurprisingly, perceptions linger behind changing realities. Polling data, such as the, those of the Arab Index, do not show a significant change in the favorability of the US, or the lack thereof, in the Arab world. Such long-lasting representations of the US role, preponderant according to detractors, and viewed as disappointing by allies and friends. Those perceptions contrast with the perceptions Arabs have of transformations within their own societies. A little, a little less than six years ago, Arab uprisings initiated an unanticipated change in a region that had seemed to be resistant to it. For some time, expectations and hopes energized the process. Today's disillusionment, although understandable, is often rushed and is at times engineered to serve the purpose of justifying attempts to reverse transition divert its course and withdraw into defensive and regressive identity politics. In spite of uncertainty and fear, the yearning for dignity, freedom, political participation, which has motivated the revolutions against patrimonial authoritarian regimes, could not be dismissed as ephemeral. The social demand for democracy, no matter how vaguely conceived is broad-based. Precarious national structures and the related fragility of national cohesion and identity was exacerbated further by the rapid, unpredicted collapse of the old order. This has favored the tendency to overemphasize the strength of primordial ties in comparison with civic ties that are constitutive of a modern democratic society. In trying in explaining his disengagement and offering his sociological and anthropological understanding of the region, 
the former American president, went as far as affirming in a sweeping statement that the organizing principle in the Middle East is tribalism. To be sure, one uh, could not ignore the resurgence or the reinvention of subnational identities and the centrifugal forces at work in many Arab countries. Many members of communities, not only minorities, seem to have lost their aspiration to a state for all. They beg for a power structure that can protect them from another community. Weakened states and political and electoral strategies of mobilization have accentuated communalism and encouraged the surfacing of narratives of victimhood, often emotional and aggressive. The very conflict that undermine what is left of the state become for many rur rulers of the region, despots in particular, a source of legitimacy, a cause for further entrenching and a distraction from addressing problems that they are not capable or unwilling to solve, such as in Syria, Iraq, Libya, and Yemen. It is not, therefore, a surprise to see violence becoming a policy by default. Some would argue that the US political decision to retreat from the Arab world meant, in actual fact, endorsing the very forces fueling the Arab nations and states' self-destruction. One could not ignore the extent to which, despite its tendency to disengage, the U.S. remains at the heart of Arab politics, at the heart of Arab politics. Friends and foes alike continue to construct their narratives and define their courses of action on the basis of what they guess to be Washington's in intentions. A striking example is the Syrian regime. Pretending to confront the USA, it keeps an eye on its response as it crosses every possible red line. Russia could not have launched its war on Syrian soil were it not convinced that the Syrian opponents of the regime, unlike the Afghans of the 1980s, had no real support from the American rival. The American withdrawal sucked Russians into the void, exacerbating tensions while trying to impose incremental solutions. With respect to the Arab-Israeli conflict, Russia is gradually positioning itself as a discreet or even a silent broker. On the right of, to self-determination and independence of the Palestinians, which is the core issue of the conflict, the principal position that Russia has espoused since Soviet times do not seem to affect its present overture towards Israel and possibly having a tacit agreement with Israel on Syria. The somewhat paradoxical situation could endure as long as US passivity persists. There might be no suggestive indications otherwise. Former President Obama reacted to the Israeli intransigence and Arab disappointment in a way that reflected the retreat of his foreign policy in the Middle East. Although he did not walk away as he did in other cases, such as Syria, his desire for a breakthrough, no matter how genuine, was periodical. There were times where he pressured Israel, but his short-lived attempts did not play well. According to many Palestinians, his stance was not much more than declaratory. He admitted that Israeli settlement activity has intentionally undermined the two-state solution, but waited until December 2016 to allow the 2,334 United Nations Security Council resolution to express an international commitment to preserve the chances of establishing a Palestinian state. This resolution, adopted with some fanfare, 
was depicted by the despairing Palestinian leadership as a big blow for Israeli politics. Many Palestinians and Arabs affirmed conversely that the, re that the resolution was weaker than the previous ones, such as the resolution 465 and its main clauses are toothless in the sense of being devoid of any coercive power to force the compliance of Israel. Be that as it may, the resolution had no life after its adoption, and the new US administration has not appropriated it. Quite the contrary, there is a mounting risk of ceasing to reframe the search of peace for peace in the light of ending colonization and occupation and considering instead that peace could be achieved if the U.S. will only help when Israelis and Palestinians are prepared to make a deal. In addition, the American administration seems to believe that the fear of Iran would create a common ground between Israel and the Gulf states, enough for them to join hands in order to resolve the Palestinian issue. A facilitating assumption is often made about these regimes' willingness to be accommodating and patient as they consider the Palestinian issue important but not urgent, as Henry Kissinger characterized the position of many Arab leaders he has met. It was reported that when Obama visited Saudi Arabia in 2009, he expected to speak with the king about the Arab-Israeli conflict, but instead had to listen to an hour-long monologue on Iran. All the impressions were confirmed. They were not created ex nihilo. Perhaps they have been perennial illusions of US diplomacy in the Middle East, failing to acknowledge that the majority of Arab peoples unlike their leaders, continue to see the Palestinian issue as a regional priority. This is again corroborated by the findings of the Arab Index in the last five years. In the context of an American foreign policy in the retreat, I'm using um, the Vali Nasser's um, title of a pertinent book, Iranian leaders are inclined to posit the victory of their so-called resistance camp. al mumana has no, no equivalent in English. Will not, will not depend on what they are able to achieve, but on the Western states choosing to lose their effective presence in the region. The USA viewed the Iranian nuclear deal as the one issue which is expected to make a difference. This has left regional players its historical allies, such as Saudi Arabia, in the anxiety of having been abandoned. Undeniably, part of this anxiety was dissipated recently by what they thought to be a rejuvenation of an old alliance, 1945 alliance. One could argue that the current American president was more concerned with asserting economic interests and prerogatives in defense, then consolidating long-term friendships. In some of the Gulf leaders' perceptions, what mattered most was the resurgence of belligerence against Iran. It remains to be seen how regional players, state and non-state actors alike, will draw the local implications of the recent hardening of the US president's position vis-a-vis -vis Iran, Iran. President uh, Obama had dropped efforts to contain Iran and sought a nuclear agreement that would allow for a normalization that could entail stabilization in Iraq, in Syria, and the rest of the region. Although the negotiations did not address but the nuclear issue, resisting every Iran attempt to make linkages to regional geopolitical considerations, their success was tantamount to a Western implicit acknowledgement that a possible consequence would be 
a more responsible regional policy adopted by Iran in reciprocation to a de facto appreciation of its sphere of influence. This has proven to be a miscalculation. It's led directly to an Iranian-Russian military alliance in Syria, greater influence in Iraq, and more interference in Yemen. Today, the administration's striking blow against the nuclear deal and the threat of more sanctions under the pretext of a highly questionable non-compliance of Iran, rather than leaves unaddressed the no nuclear Iranian destabilization, f destabilizing behavior and its meddling into Arab affairs. More, the disavowal of the nuclear agreement, strongly criticized by the Western partners of the USA, makes it harder to mobilize an international pressure against Iran's interventionism in the region, whether direct or by proxy. For its part, designating the Revolutionary Guard as a terrorist group falls short of putting it on the State Department list and suggests a measure of necessary caution to avoid impeding the military operations against ISIS in Iraq and Syria, where Iran and Western countries find themselves in the same battlefield. It is indeed confusing to hear the US permanent representative to the UN escalate confrontation with Iran, denouncing what she calls outlaw behavior, and on the very day, on the very day where the battle, the battle of Kirkuk put the US and Iran on the same side. Iran's nuclear capacities, which may not be easily diverted for military purposes, have not been a crucial issue in the eyes of most Arabs, including those who resent its role in their countries. The controversy over the development of its nuclear program was an occasion to remember that Israel is a nuclear state and it is perceived as a more severely threatening power than Iran and remind the international community of the repeated call in multilateral fora for a nuclear-free Middle East. In my own country, Lebanon, there is a widespread disquiet of Israel's temptation it is minimal for the time being, but it's always there, temptation to seize the opportunity of a confrontational posture with American confrontational posture with Iran and contemplate attacks on Iran's proxy, Hezbollah, with a heavy toll on Lebanon as a collateral damage, just like it was in 2006. In Syria, there is no single sign suggesting that the pressure on Iran would wield a change in US policy or the lack thereof in Syria. Since the beginning of the Syrian uprising in 2011, US support was primarily in words rather than in deeds, while affirming that Assad must go and therefore raising to an unrealistic level the protesters' expectations. President Obama not only ruled out any form of military intervention, but refrained from any effort to ensure the protection of the civilian population in Syria. In this regard, and having not considered options that could have been alternative to massive military strikes a la Libyenne, the US support to Syrian opposition remained largely ineffective. Today, and by all accounts, the Russian interventionist policy in Syria has been a success. It solidified Assad's position, protected its military base, led regional actors, including allies of the USA, to rethink its role in the region, and accumulated at a low cost a variety of bargaining chips with present and future regional and international actors in the Syrian tragedy. At present, Russia's undisputed control of 
the Astana process, the only game in town, as Russian officials like to call it, delays a real political process. Derails and delays a real political process worthy of the name, because a real political process worthy of the name should be based on Geneva Agreement of June 2012 and the Security Council Resolution of 2254 of December 2015, whose main thrust is the establishment not of the escalation zones, part of a transitional governing body with full executive powers. Officials in Moscow do not hesitate to attribute, even if partly, the delaying of the political process, uh, come to the USA, to the fact they, that they do not have, for the time being, international interlocutors, let alone partners. President Trump's position on Syria is less ambiguous than that of his predecessor. This is not only exemplified in his use of words, but also in his short-lived short -lived exception of miss missile attacks on a Syrian military airport following Assad's use of chemical weapons in Khan Sheikh. Most likely, Assad crossed a red line because he did not think that the US president would care Subsequently, and having had to stop the use of chemical weapons, he preferred instead to revert to conventional forms of mass murder. The American president repeatedly said that he would not try to remove Assad, nor prioritize human rights. To be sure, his singular focus is the defeat of ISIS, and he would not act where American interests are not threatened. It seems unlikely that the heavy-handed Iranian presence in Syria be considered a threat to American interests, even from the perspective of the present confrontation with Iran. Trump's intransigent position on Iran does not signal a radical and wide-ranging change in US policy in the Middle East. It could be interpreted and was interpreted in the light of his desire to undo Obama's legacy as it is manifested in his domestic policy decisions. However, and in spite of the exception of Iran, his foreign policy expresses and reinforces an isolationist sentiment in Washington. More than 10 years ago, US interventionism saw the mass it helped create in the region, so in it the birth pangs of the new Middle East remember Condoleezza Rice. But more recent policies of retreat, whether motivated by Obama's willingness to move away from bellicose postures or by Trump's disinterest, did not contribute to regional stability and transition toward more inclusive and participatory societies. Quite the contrary. Thank you. Thank you, Tariq, for presenting uh, a substantive and comprehensive Arab perspective on uh, U.S. policy uh, in the Arab world at, uh, at this time. And uh, we do have a few minutes for questions and answers. For those questions that have already been submitted, I would appreciate receiving those. Thank you. There's some more there. First question uh, is from uh, Mohammed Chinnawi, Voice of America. With U.S. defense officials anticipating a flow of ISIS fighters uh, fleeing to Libya, how differently should the Trump administration engage in Libya at this time? And uh, the next question is from Jeff Gates, uh, New Rock Group. After the success of Israel's operation, uh, Trojan indu uh, induced, sorry about the, the reading here, the, the light is not great. Uh, the Reagan-Thatcher 
uh, to launch uh, Operation Condor, uh, bombing Tripoli and Benghazi. The Mossad announced at the time its intention to uh, market Saddam Hussein's and the next uh, evil as the next evil doer. Please comment on the Israeli use of the crisis to advance its own hegemonic interest in the region. And the third one, um, what would it take to get military, uh, military battlefield shifting to the diplomatic battlefield at the UN? Let's start with these uh, three questions, Tariq, if you don't mind. And then if we have time, we have a couple more questions for you. Well, on, on, on Libya, uh, the US is, is disengaged with the rebuilding of the Libyan state, but not, never disengaged with its fight against uh, terrorism. Uh, they have had, since the war in Mali uh, and the defeat of uh, the Al-Qaeda and the Islamic Maghrib, they, uh, they have targeted uh, Al-Qaeda and Al-Qaeda related and subsequently ISIS groups in, in southern Libya and later in Sirte and this continues. So there has never been a disengagement on fighting Al-Qaeda and Daesh. The disengagement I was referring to was disengagement with Libya itself, with reconstructing Libya, with stabilizing Libya and then reconstructing the state. Of course, I mean, Israel uh, benefits from, uh, from fragmentation, uh, from divisions, from the weakening of national states uh, to further its hegemony over the region. I mean, it's uh, examples such as the one mentioned and many others corroborate uh, this. Now, what does it take to, uh, to move away from a military strategy to diplomacy is, is, is an extremely difficult question, I, and I'm not the one to advise the American uh, foreign policy makers uh, as to how uh, best it is done. But I see that diplomacy on the decline uh, in, in, uh, in our region. And as I said in my uh, presentation, uh, the realities of the Arab world are seen from the very narrow lens of counterterrorism. I mean, look at Syria, look at Iraq, look at Yemen, and by seeing the realities of the region through this lens, then you commit all the mistakes you, we all see. You're unable to, uh, to propose uh, political processes that would help the Arabs get out of the present uh, situation. Uh. What about the uh, current uh, Turkish uh, position in, in the Middle East, and do you feel that it will uh, likely affect the U.S. position in the region? Is there any correlation between the two? Well, I mean, Turkish policy in the region is also in retreat for different reasons than, uh, than those of uh, the American withdraw withdrawals in various uh, internal realities of Turkey, his obsession with the mounting influence of Kurds, and then the threat that the Kurdish nationalist movement uh, presents to, uh, to the Turkish regime has, in a way, paralyzed uh, Turkey's role in Syria or confined it <laughs> to, uh, to its uh, most limited uh, realm, and Turkey, short of having been treated by the U.S. as a loyal ally uh, throughout those years, ended up becoming a minor partner of Russia in, in, in Syria. And I see this continuing for, for a good while. Uh, there are a couple of questions regarding your experience, uh, international role that you played in uh, Libya. Uh, what are the main lessons that you could convey to us with regards uh, learned from that uh, experience? Well, uh, I, I wrote a book to trying to answer this question. That's not, that's not easy to, uh, 
to draw lessons in a few minutes, but um, I've already alluded to, to, uh, to the fact that massive military intervention, uh, whatever the reason, the original reason was, in that case it was the protection of civilian population in Benghazi against uh, a massacre that Gaddafi could have perpetrated. Uh, this intervention motivated by R2P ended up uh, toppling uh, Gaddafi's regime, ended up destroying uh, whatever existed of Libyan state institutions, and left Libya uh, at the time where those who broke Lib Libya had to stay and try and fix it. <laughs> Libya uh, needed a stabilization force after uh, the NATO military uh, attacks. Instead of having a stabilization force, uh, the United Nations Security Council created a United Nations political mission <laughs> that I, I had to uh, lead. Uh, I mean, the, the task was far uh, more important than the means the United Nations political mission had. You cannot uh, reconstruct a state. You cannot demilitarize 200,000 militiamen with a couple of hundred or 300 uh, UN experts. Uh, but the responsibility is not only on, uh, on Western powers that intervened and then turned their backs to Libya, but their declaratory, pol their declaratory politics have not changed, but the <laughs> reality is that they have turned their backs. Um, but the responsibility is not theirs only, it's the international community, it's the Security Council, uh, and it's, it's the responsibility of the Libyans themselves. Uh, I mean, Libya's emerging political elite has acted most irresponsibly during the transition period. Uh, for them, competing, which you may say is a normal thing for politicians, competing over power, was far more important than building state institutions. And we, the international community, helped them do so by organizing early elections uh, in a divided, fragmented society, in a society where there are no uh, state institutions uh, worthy of the name. Uh, elections uh, exacerbate divisions rather than uh, reunite a fragmented people. <laughs> and I remember every time I went to the Security Council and suggested that we should not rush for elections, I was told that uh, transition to democracy, I mean, it's, uh, it's elections, constitution, new elections on the basis of the new constitution. This is how transition to democracy is. I said, this is how it was in Chile. This is how it was in Bulgaria. But this won't work in, in, uh, in Libya, but no one was willing to listen. <laughs> and this is one of the most uh, painful, as it were, lessons I learned from, from that Libyan experience. Uh, thank you, Tariq, very much. Uh, I know there are several more questions. However, we are out of time, and we need to proceed uh, with the program and try to stay on time for the rest of the day. And uh, please join me one more time in thanking Tariq for traveling all the way from Lebanon to be with us today.